There are three golden exercise rules when it comes to reducing belly fat and visceral body fat. That's what we're going to talk about in today's episode. This feels like an old 80s it does, huh? magazine ad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it does. What are you going to tell us, Sal? It's the title. Well, first yeah. of all, first of all, let's let's talk about the difference of belly fat and visceral fat. Yeah. Um, because I do, I do think that this is this is actually really important to discuss because there is a, a difference mm -hmm. uh, in how how body fat shows up on our body, um, how we hold water, and a lot of times um, people uh, look at like their reflection in the mirror or even the scale going up or down and get discouraged, and they're actually on the right path uh, and doing things the right way, and they course correct yeah. when they were totally fine. And so let's let's break down the different different types of body fat and also retaining water and how that looks different on our bodies, all that stuff. So first. the visceral body fat um, is the body fat that's under, it's, it's, it's around the organs. It's under the muscle. Yeah. Okay. So I've used this example before, but it's like that, you know, everybody has that uncle with a big belly that's hard. Yeah. Like, how is that hard? It's like a big belly. It's the one that people don't consider as much. I yes. Would say. Yeah. yeah. This is the one that's most, it's, it's more closely related to poor health outcomes. Yeah. Visceral body fat. Well, you could label the bad, you know, body fat. What, didn't you guys have this? I remember getting this um, as a trainer. I remember it like totally threw me off too. Where the first time I remember it was a uh, some model or like a cheerleader, right? And she came in, and I was doing her body fat test, and she looked like really, really lean. Like she looked skinny, and I and I remember taking her body fat test, and her body fat test was really, really high. And a lot of times you'll have somebody who has a higher body fat but doesn't look like they're that, and they have a lot more visceral fat going on, yeah. and mm -hmm. and that can be more it's dangerous. really elusive that way. Well, and and I and I explain I've explained this to my clients on the other side who really show their body fat percentage. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, hey, you know, sometimes that can be a blessing in disguise because you're very aware that there's uh, that it's unhealthy to be where you're yes. at. Where I've had cases where people have really poor eating habits and because in the mirror they look like they mm -hmm. don't have a lot of body fat, but their body fat percentage yeah. is really high, that can be very unhealthy and very dangerous because you think you're okay. Well, you, you, you'll gain both if you're eating more calories and you're burning, to put it loosely. Uh, so if you're in a calorie, what's called a calorie surplus, or if you're eating more calories than you're burning, your body will take those extra calories of the energy and it'll store it. It doesn't just evaporate or disappear. Uh, it's a it's a law of thermodynamics, right? Your, your body takes that extra energy and stores it as body fat. So both visceral and regular types of body fat increase or go up when you're eating more or consuming more calories uh, than you're burning. There's lots of ways to change that formula so that you can lose body fat. But nonetheless, if you want to lose, it's got to be lower, right? Your energy has to be lower intake than than output. That being said, there's a a a, a ratio of visceral to regular body fat that changes based off of metabolic health. And so all excess body fat past a certain point isn't good for you. But if there's a high ratio of visceral body fat, it's 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 even worse, okay? And that's more closely connected to insulin resistance. So you or stress, high stress and insulin resistance. So what you sometimes see in skinny fat people, in fact, this is more common in skinny fat people. If you look at the data on uh, heart disease, diabetes, um, you know all these all these chronic diseases related to obesity, obviously if you're obese, your the, your your rate of getting those things is much higher. Or if you were to look at people who got heart disease, you look at people who got diabetes, majority of them are obese. But there's a sizable minority. Mm -hmm that are not obese. They're actually normal body weight, sometimes under body weight. And mm -hmm. it's in some cases, 15 to 20%. So if you look at all the people that get a heart attack or get heart disease, that represents millions of people. What the hell is going on? No. They have a lot of visceral body fat. They also have very little muscle, which is you know kind of what we're going to get to. One of the best ways to improve insulin sensitivity, one of the fastest ways to increase insulin, uh, improve Lean insulin sensitivity tissue. is to build muscle. Um, so now why is this the case? Well, first off, what is insulin resistance? This is when your body gets the insulin, uh, gets the insulin signal. You eat carbohydrates or sugar or food and energy is released in the blood. Your body releases insulin, insulin goes up and then it takes all that out of the blood and, in, and brings it into muscle or into your liver to, to store or to use uh, for energy, over time through poor health uh, and and bad lifestyle, um, you know factors, 
your body stops responding to the same amount of insulin. So then your body needs to produce more insulin and then more insulin and then more insulin. And then what happens, you develop insulin resistance. Uh, and if it gets real bad, it becomes type two uh, diabetes. Well, muscle is very sensitive to insulin. Like some insulin comes out when you have more muscle or it's healthy and strong muscle, it sucks in all those amino acids. It sucks in all that glycogen. Um, it's from, like a reserve tank, right? Like it's also where you store yeah, carbohydrates. Right. It's one of the places you store it aside from the liver. So the more muscle you have or the or the 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 more fit it is, the more you can store glycogens. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right. Back to the show. If you were to get into a contest to improve your insulin sensitivity and you had to do it as much as possible and you're competing with other people and you only had a month to do it, your best bet would be to build muscle. Yes. It would be the best way to do it. And so what you see is you see uh, low-muscled individuals, which by the way, okay, there used to be a myth back in the day where, and I remember when this myth was shattered, that over obese individuals, overweight individuals had more muscle mass. Yeah. Yeah, you I, I, that? I feel like that still persists. It, it still does because yeah. I, I mean, I still it still feels that way when you look at someone really obese and you see these giant calves on yeah, them. Yeah, you're yeah. Like, oh, they must have a lot of muscle. Yeah. Look at those calves. You know what I'm saying? No, and I remember it was shattered. I don't remember how many years ago where they did these body scans and they showed their skeletal structure and their muscle mass, and they had less. So sarco so so uh, sarcopenia is actually more common. Yeah. And people with and obesity, obese. yeah. and especially in people with type two diabetes, because- it almost defies logic in a sense because you'd think them carrying more weight would, you know, sort of promote the the fact that they need yeah. muscle tissue to support this big frame. But yeah, not the case. It, so it's yeah, their their bones are are definitely more compromised in terms of, uh, you know, you'll see osteopenia, you'll yep. see that osteoarthritis, like those symptoms as as a result of that lifestyle. Yeah. So. So, um, so building muscle helps both of them to become more sensitive to insulin, and it's it's especially helpful uh, for people with uh, who are trying to deal with visceral body fat. And this is also why, if you were to look at a strength athlete that was also <clears throat> obese and or had high body fat percentage, so sometimes you'll find these extreme strength athletes like Olympic lifters or power lifters or, and the such. What you'll see is they're still you know, over fat, right? Uh, but they have so much muscle that they don't suffer from insulin resistance and their visceral body fat tends to be lower as a percentage of their overall body weight. So you've made a great case to why lifting weights, building muscle is obviously important, but I think uh, it's important to, what are the rules? Because there, yes. there's a way to do that where this becomes very effective and then there's a way to do this and it's very ineffective. Yes. And I think many times the client who is trying to avoid uh, body fat, belly fat, um, re reducing uh, body fat percentage uh, goes about this the wrong way. And so I I have found, and I, when you were putting this episode together, the the three main kind of rules is like, these are like the key things that I would have to repeat to these clients of yes. like, I understand that this is the, the goal that you have. Trust me that this is the approach that we want to go about it if you want to be successful in that approach. Totally. In fact, in fact, if you don't follow these three rules, the odds that you'll get any of the success that we're going to talk about from strength training is very low. And, I, and I'll, I'll put a cherry on top. Strength training, and the studies now support this, but this is what we observed for decades in gyms. This is what trainers and coaches have known for a long time, but now we have the data to show this. The most effective form of exercise for pure fat loss, pure fat loss, not weight loss on the scale, because that oftentimes includes muscle, which is what you see on studies uh, done on other forms of exercise where people go calorie restricted and then they run their butts off. You see weight loss, but then what you see is 40% of it coming from muscle. Strength training and calorie uh, deficit or restriction results in the most pure body fat loss you'll get from any form of exercise. So if you don't want to slow your metabolism down, which is what happens when you're when you pair muscle down, you want to improve insulin sensitivity mm -hmm. or at the very least maintain it. You 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 got to do strength training, and strength training is going to do that for you. So burning bad, you know, when it comes to reducing belly fat, visceral body, you know, fat, all that stuff, or just overall body fat, strength training is the way uh, to go. But there are three rules around it, and if you don't follow these rules then you're not going to reap the benefits of strength training. And the first one is to lift like a strength athlete, okay? 
if you're going to do strength training and it's going to be strength training and you want the benefits that come from strength training, it needs to be for strength. Yeah. You need and, proper rest periods. Yes. You, huge, you, huge. It's, it's, it's not uh, to sweat. It's not to be in a class. Yeah, it's to burn. It's not to move a lot. Yeah. It's not to... Like if you watch strength athletes lift weights, bodybuilders will even be in that category. You watch them work out and they work out hard, but they're lifting weights to get stronger yeah. and they're resting between sets and they're lifting weights to get stronger. It's not this continual motion. Everything of, is of pro exercise. strength. Yeah. It's not about just the sweating and being in condition, um, which defies again to the, to the way to do it wrong is what the typical person would have this outlook of like, I need to lose this body fat. I need to lose weight in general. So I need to move more and I need to eat less and I need to do this yeah. quickly yeah. Uh, and as quick as possible to burn calories. But we need to promote strength. We need to build strength, which then in fact builds muscle, which then, you know, you will have all those benefits. You mentioned. So what, what does that look like? That looks like longer rest periods. Yep. That looks like paying attention to uh, adding weights. more weight before yeah. Yeah, get stronger. Uh, keep trying to burn yeah. or to like, I think a metric that people that uh, do this the wrong way, they look for how sore was I the workout how before? Sweaty did I get? How sweaty, how yes. exhausted was I? You know, yeah. how much did my muscles burn during it? How hard was it for me to complete the, the hour workout yeah. when this is not what I want you to be focused on? I want you to focus on, okay, today when we squatted, we did this much. Last week, we did this. Next week, we're going to try and do this. That's right. Like, I am trying to get, and, when, and that looks like, slowing down the technique, working on the form, working on being able to lift more weight. And aiming the, to get stronger. Yes, yeah. as the number one thing that I want to, to train and above all other things. And I think that it's hard to get the fat loss, weight loss client in that mindset because yeah. we've, I think we've, we've uh, taught them for so long that the idea is to sweat and burn yeah. the Look, body fat. Everything's a hustle. You need to run and burn everything off. Listen, and I'll say it very clearly. Stop trying to burn calories with your workouts. Instead, try to teach your body to burn more calories on its own. It's a far more effective and efficient approach. You could work out real hard for an hour and burn maybe 400 calories. And I know what the cardio machines say, 800, 900, those are lying. The average person's going to be lucky to burn four, 500 calories in a really intense workout. Well, what if you could teach your body to do that all the time on its own? It's possible. And the way you do that is by building muscle. And you don't have to build a ton of muscle. I know that some people will say, oh, one pound of muscle only burns this much or whatever. That's not how it works. Metabolism's far more complex than that. When you take the average person and you feed them and train them in a, with strength training in a direction to build strength and muscle, gaining four or five pounds of muscle and dramatically improving their strength, first off, the four or five pounds of muscle doesn't show up as being much bigger. It just feels tighter. That's all. You just, you feel your body and it feels solid and firm and you get a little bit uh, better shape to your body. So it doesn't really show up as being much bigger, but what it does is it speeds up your metabolism to the tune of 300, 400. I've seen people boost their metabolism of over 800 calories a day. So now imagine you're burning more calories and you're not doing all this exercise all the time. You just wake up and you're burning more calories because that's the beauty of strength training. Strength athletes don't lift weights all the time. You lift weights a few days a week is typically what you'll see some of the best, uh, you know, strength athletes train. And for the average person, two days a week is a great way I'm to do it. I'm glad you went there because that's another great point that I just kind of skipped and didn't think about is another mistake that this, this typical avatar client does is thinking more is better as far as like, you know, they love to do their classes, show up five, seven days a week and think right. the more, the more I do, the better off I'm going to be. And that doesn't work that way when it comes to building strength. There is a sweet spot totally of yep. how much uh you want to train the body so that it not only uh receives that signal to build muscle but it also gives it adequate rest and recovery so it actually can get stronger mm -hmm. big trap that people fall into is thinking oh i'm motivated i want to lose this belly fat let's go and they're doing lots and more and more and more and 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 they're doing all these days of lifting intensity and they're not allowing the body to actually recover adapt and get stronger it's just and the strength point that you're making, yeah, it's just it's surviving. A, it's a very easy thing to know if you're if you're applying the, the the proper amount of 
volume, meaning how much training you're doing, because if you're not getting stronger week over week, week over week, then something's wrong. We're That's probably right. applying too much intensity or too much volume, and you need to scale back on it because there is a sweet spot to maximize your results and going to the gym. And it isn't the more you do, the more you get. No, your your body can only tolerate and adapt to so much, and especially if you haven't done this before or you haven't done this in a long time, it doesn't take much. And then to more than that is actually becomes very quickly too much. Now the key to this to this golden rule, uh, which is train like a strength athlete. The key to it is. The goal of a strength athlete is is singular. It's to get stronger. So that's the main core of this particular you know rule, which is when you're going to work out and you want to burn body fat, you want to get leaner, you want your belly fat to go down, you want to decrease your visceral body fat, all that stuff, improve your insulin sensitivity. The metric you go for is strength. Go to the gym. Am I getting stronger? Does the exercise feel more stable? I'm moving in the right direction versus what a lot of people do is they ignore if they're getting stronger, because all they focus on is the sweat, all yeah. they focus on is the burn. No, no, no. Get stronger, train like a strength athlete. And the second rule is to focus on what are known in strength training as the big lifts. When you hear, you'll hear people in the fitness world refer to certain exercises as the big lifts. Mm -hmm. Loosely, you can put these in a category of what are known as compound lifts, okay? So without getting too technical, compound means two. Uh, and you're using two or more joints in this exercise. So if I were to do a curl, that would not be a compound lift. If I were to do a pull-up, I am doing a compound lift. Now, both of them work the biceps, but pulling up also works my back muscles and many other muscles because I'm also working the shoulder joint, not just the elbow joint. Big lifts tend to fall in the category of compound lifts. Now, more traditionally, if we narrow it down even more, squat, bench press, overhead press, barbell rows, like those movements kind of fall in that category of big lifts. Now, why? Why is it so important to focus on the big lifts? Well, to put it simply, if you gain 10 pounds of strength in a big lift, it shows up way more than if you gain 10 pounds of strength in other lifts. Like adding 10 pounds to your curl, that's pretty cool. Not a, you know, that's great. 10 pounds to your squat, much bigger effect on the body. So if you're in, if you're one of those people, that's like, I don't feel like spending all day in the gym, wasting my time. I want the most bang for my buck. Well, the big lifts are going to do that. Focus on those. Yeah. It's more taxing. It's, it, it requires more force production. It requires uh, a lot more muscles to be involved, to stabilize, to uh, operate and, and to be able to uh, complete this, this movement. And um, you're just getting a lot more out of one particular exercise by doing it this way, which then results in, um, you know, much, much bigger uh, results in terms of being able to build muscle mass. It's yeah. the foundational movements for all other pursuits. And it is one of the easiest ways for the consumer, okay, to figure out if you have a good coach or trainer or a good program in front of you. If it is not centered around those four core lifts and that's not a bulk of what your your beginner program looks like, run. You don't have a good trainer. Right. You don't have a good program. Or if they're not trying to get you to those lifts, right? Yes. You can't perform. Right. Them. So that's right. a good example. Like, yeah. okay, so there's an example, there's an uh, there's a uh, example where a client is very deconditioned and and or maybe had an injury or something and I can't get them to do a proper squat yet but I'm working towards that that's right, right. so the, and that's what I mean by it should be the cornerstone or the centerpiece or mostly everything surround around those core lifts is because nothing is going to move the needle faster and more in your pursuit of leaning out and then sustaining that that body and it, and it's so crazy because I remember as a, a young trainer how much I went away from this, uh, and that, and again, it shows uh, my immaturity and youth because I train clients this way. Because I was so fixated on, uh, you know, dazzling my client with new exercises and unique yeah. things. They've already seen a squat. They've seen a bench yeah. press. Right, yeah. unique things. And I need to entertain them. And by the way, I remember when we first started this podcast, and we weren't very well known. And the only program that we had offered, which was Maps Anabolic, was basically an example of what those core of building a program or those core lifts. And we knew should be the cornerstone for most people. And if we ever, like we were less than 4% of people have ever returned any of the programs that we have. But if we ever were to get it, this was always the response and it always used to crack us yeah. up, which would be like, 
This is too basic. Yeah, I've seen I already, these exercises. I already know these. Exercises. I know these exercises. <laughs> Why would I pay for this? And like, it's like, great. oh wow. <laughs> that I mean, and that would be an example of wow. This person doesn't understand how important it is. Like, of course, we could have wrote up a program with a bunch of crazy, random, hard technical exercises or things they've never done before to make them super sore and fail at them. But that's not the desired outcome. The desired outcome is to train like train like this athlete to get strong, to build muscle, to build the metabolism, so your body will lose body fat much easier, and you'll be able to keep it off for a long time. And that is done through building around a routine like this with those core lifts. And if it's not most of your routine, then you don't have a good routine. In fact, I'll make this statement right here that I'll stand by. If the average person went to the gym and practiced a couple compound lifts every time they went that's all they did they that's, went into it. that's it they would get far better results than following 95 percent of the popular mainstream media type workout programs that are out there and that's a fact Facts. they are very effective they're very effective at stimulating lots of muscles to try to build to improve that insulin sensitivity so that your body has less of that visceral body fat it speeds up the metabolism more it, it don't worry about again don't worry about calorie burn worry about teaching your body to burn more calories and these big lifts just do it in less time in comparison to uh, most other exercises it's so effective that later on in my career when i had clients that i knew i had to meet them where they're at where they were just not ready to go to the gym three days a week and they were I had to ease them in with a couple exercises. I could literally take somebody and teach them to do a squat and an overhead press and just say, this is all I want you to practice right now. And I'd like for you to do it one to two days a week if I can get you to do it. And that's it. And just let's yeah. get good at those movements. And they would look at me like, that. that's it? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. Just practice those movements, try and get strong in those movements, and then I'm going to add to that as we go on. And it would blow them away how much results they would get just, just from, from those two movements mm -hmm. alone. That's how valuable they are. That's how important they are that you build your, your, your routine around movements like that. That's right. By the way, this episode is brought to you by a sponsor, Intera Skincare. Try them out within literally two to three applications. You'll notice a difference. Definitely by week two you notice a huge difference. Go check them out. Go to enteraskincare.com forward slash MPM. Use the code MPM and get 10% off your order. Hey, real quick, here's the August special. We got two programs on sale, 50% off. MAPS bands, half off. And MAPS 40 plus, that's also 50% off. If you want either one, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code AUGUST50 for that discount. Back to the show. Now, lastly, uh, the following is extremely true. Just because you're holding weights in your hands does not mean you're doing strength training. In other words, stop doing cardio with weights. This is every single strength training group class you'll ever do in your entire life, There's, with very, very few exceptions. If you're going to do a popular, fun, you know, Group X class that's got titled in like strength training with whatever, build your butt with whatever, what you're doing is cardio with weights. You're taking the weights, you're doing a 50 million reps, you're not resting, you're trying to go, 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 and you're just, now it's just a prop, right? The weight becomes a prop, you're not strength training, you might as well put it down and jump in place, you're doing a cardio workout. So one of the, the hallmarks of what makes strength training strength training is the rest periods in between sets, and it's the rep range. The rep ranges for traditional strength training is between one and let's say 20 to 25 reps. You go beyond that, or you go without rest periods, you're now moving into something that isn't strength training altogether. So if you, one of the golden rules with for, for workouts, for fat loss, uh, especially in this case, is don't do cardio with weights. That's not lifting weights. And you have to talk about what, tends to happen to this person, right? The the client that loves the Orange Theory, the F45, the Barry's Boot Camp, that they love this modality of training and maybe even saw initial weight loss from it. And so they hear you saying that and they're like, sure. I don't care what you say. I lost 30 pounds doing Barry's Boot Camp and it was great for me, Sal. And what ends up happening to that person is, yeah, initially the, the rule of thermodynamics is still applies. It's a law, right? So it, it does apply. If you move a lot more than what you're eating, consuming, you will lose weight. The problem with that is to your point about not doing cardio with weights is basically what you did was just lots of cardio and ate less. And so then your body did 
it is catabolic. It did lose. It did lose weight. But then what comes from that is a big, hard plateau, a hard plateau and a person who lost 10, 15, or 30 pounds. But almost all of that, not only was a bunch of muscle and body fat, but now they have slowed their metabolism down. And now they're in an even more difficult place and they're still not all the way to their goal. And what ends up happening is that person either- It's unsustainable. Yeah. They're either stuck in that rut for a very long time or become so unsustainable, they throw their hands up and they give up. That's right. And then they rebound and they rebound even harder. That's why it is so important to go back to the first rule, which is the way we want to apply strength training is like a strength athlete with the intent to get stronger with longer rest periods, mm -hmm. focusing on the core lifts to try and build as much muscle so we can build a metabolism that burns these calories on its own, even when I'm not going out there and doing all this activity, which makes the overall okay. weight loss journey now, I'm going to explain a little bit uh, why cardio workouts uh, done with the, in calorie restriction tend to promote muscle loss uh, with the weight loss. So whenever you do a form of exercise that's challenging, it's a stress on the body, and the body aims to adapt to that by becoming better at what you're asking it to do. What cardio asks your body to do, if I were to grab a set of dumbbells and move around for 45 minutes like a, like a group class, right? Like I'm doing lunges and now doing overhead presses and now squat with curls and now back step lunge with a punch or whatever and I'm just moving, moving, moving. Not strength training, it's, called, it's cardio. And, and what that's asking my body to do is build lots of endurance. But what it doesn't need is a lot of strength with that. In fact, you'll find this. Like keep going after about two minutes, you're not very strong. You're just moving. Your body knows it doesn't need strength. It needs stamina and it needs endurance. And also in those initial phases, you are burning a lot of calories while you're moving. It's a manual way of doing it. It's, a, it's not a very efficient way of doing it, but you are burning a lot of calories. So your body says high calorie burn during this activity. We need stamina. And what we don't need is a lot of strength. Well, there's a real easy way to accomplish all those. And that is to pair muscle down. Pairing muscle down is not a problem with stamina. You can get plenty of stamina with very little muscle. And your you know, case in point, look at some of the best endurance athletes. They're skinny, not just lean, but also very little muscle. But also it's reducing the reducing muscle mass reduces your caloric requirements. So it's making you an efficient machine for cardio. Now, strength training sends a different signal. So we need to be strong. We don't need anything else. We just need strength. Mm -hmm. So your body's like, we need muscle. We need to have we this muscle. We need to overcome these forces That's right. that are, you know, like really challenging for us versus, you know, the whole cardio thing. It's like, so we're, we're basically telling our body, like this weight that we are carrying right now is not fit for us to be able to sustain. And so we need to pare down. We need to, we need to get smaller. We need to reduce the overall muscle mass, which it's not going to identify specifically fat as the only culprit to this. This is our entire weight that we're, we need to be able to conserve this energy, be more effective and efficient with this because this is something that we're going to do continuously. And if you're an endurance athlete, it's not a bad thing, but if you're like, Hey, I just want to get lean and I want to work out a few days a week or two days a week, then, then you want to do what's effective and, and what happens this, by the way, what it looks like is to back to Adam's point, you cut your calories and you do cardio with weights or you just do cardio. You initially do lose weight, but then your metabolism slows way down and you, and you plateau eventually down the line, you're left in a place where you're requiring your body requires to maintain all that exercise, which now at this point is probably a lot and a low calorie diet, not sustainable. On the flip side, if you do this with strength training and you build muscle, build the metabolism, many times you end up at the end of this journey. Now, if you have good coaching or you're doing this right, this is possible. I've done this many times where a person loses 20 pounds and they're eating more at the end. They actually have a faster metabolism than they walked into. In other words, to stay leaner than they were before, they eat more food. That is far more of a sustainable place to be. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out.